guys, welcome back to Ironside Ranch. We've got on-site Trav with us again today. We are going to be talking about food for us. So, Trav, how are you doing tonight? Good, man. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm still trying to get over this cold. So, uh, I told you before, but I'll let everyone know. I'm going to mute it while I'm uh, while I'm not talking while Travis is going. So, if I uh, if I forget to uh, to unmute it, Travis is going to wave his arms and let me know. But uh, uh, I'm still coughing quite a bit, so I just can't seem to get rid of it. Uh, but what we we both been doing kind of these series on our channels about food for us and. Uh, Really just the idea of having, you know, uh, perennial sustainable food for us. You know, something that, that's coming back every year or that's, uh, you know, that's a tree or something like that, that that doesn't necessarily need to come back, but just dies off in the fall, goes dormant. And uh, and, and that has something that's uh, really maintenance work as opposed to like replanting a garden every year. Um, and that's what we've both been kind of focusing on. And what we've noticed is, you know, just some of the times in the comments, you're getting people that, that don't think it's doable or uh, you're always getting that, well, you're down south. We can't do that up here. So we thought, well, let's let's dive into this a little bit and uh, figure out, OK, how do we get started? And uh, the idea is what can we grow on like an acre or even less than an acre of food uh, in in in, in North America, basically anywhere in North America. Obviously, it's going to change a little bit from from the south end to the northern end. But uh, that being kind of the idea. Yep. Yep. So I think, I think just starting out is the key. I went to a buddy's house in Pittsburgh. Well, it wasn't Pittsburgh, but it was Pennsylvania recently. We did a hunting trip up there and he told me like, once this pandemic hit, he bought like 25 years, years worth of seed supply. And I was like, that's cool. How many have you planted? (laughs) And, uh, and so it was one of those like, uh, well, we haven't really started yet. Now they've farmed this land. It's been in this family for over 50 years. So they've done like a very large garden when he's, he's just travels a lot. So he hadn't had a chance to do it. Um, but I think the, the main thing that I would encourage anyone to do is try to grow like one or two things, mm-hmm. even if it's just tomatoes or eggplants. And I was a kid, I lived up in Boston. And so I did eggplants with my grandmother in the summertime. And I did all the, all the typical like Northern stuff, like the squash and the zucchini, you know, you try your hand at everything and see what works. But what I'm learning down here in Southwest Florida, and I would imagine this is everywhere, but we have really poor soil here. It's essentially sand. It used to be underwater, so you can find like seashells and stuff in the soil. And it's not even soil. It's really sand. Um, I've been getting mulch chips from tree companies for free. They come and drop them off. You can use an app called Chip Drop if you, if you want to try to get on there and find a find yeah, a match we're uh, unfortunately so far out that chip probably yeah. will come here but we, yeah. we did contact the power company and asplen will deliver so we're waiting for a couple nice. of those from asplen to hopefully get nice. some because we want it for bedding and for those for that carbon to control the animal uh, manure and everything as well yeah that's been key for me i didn't understand this literally until like two years ago and i i did my little mulching thing with my chips and i'm like i'm doing it and one of my buddies came out he's like trav i'm talking a foot and a half two feet of chips mm-hmm. and i'm like really and he's like dude two feet of chips. And, and I'm telling you this stuff that I, you know, I didn't plant into it the first year, but I put that out. And whenever I got weeds, I'd knock them down with a weed whacker, add more to it. But right now, man, that stuff is just black dirt. I got worms flowing through it and everything like that. Um, I just started getting a little bit fancy with adding some ash. So I'll burn some of my waste. Like I'll, I'll take some sticks and, you know, whatever I'm trimming and I'll put it in a little bonfire. And when it gets dry enough, I'll light it up and then I'll extinguish it before it's completely gone and kind of rake it out. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting like good ash, good char. And I didn't know how potent that stuff really is because I actually ended up over treating and killing a few things this year. Yeah, we, um, we had a similar problem actually. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the idea for those watching is um, it essentially sucks the carbon out of the atmosphere. Once you get activated charcoal, and we can, you know, there's different ways to activate charcoal, but it's it, essentially you soak it in water for a period of time, and it'll activate. And, and the idea is that, like, on one piece of ash, you'll have an actual uh, – it doesn't sound quite right, but this is the math. Um, you will have a the surface area of a football field mm-hmm. uh, on one piece of ash, and it will be loaded with microbacteria. Mm-hmm. And so if you bury that and it gets buried in with your soil, it's essentially sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and into the root base of your plants. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, literally up to 100 years from now, uh, people may ask, like, why are those mangoes just so big and fat? And it, it literally has to do with the, with the ash that you've got in the soil. 
Yeah, so. I, think, I mean, the key is, is obviously getting your soil correct. And that's one thing that I think people forget about. And, and you can cheat those zones and, and grow things in hardier zones or, 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 or in, in harsher zones that they're not required for. Uh, if you've got good soil and you take your time to actually develop something there. Um, one of the biggest issues that we, we have, everything that we have is either sand or clay. So, I mean, that there's very little um, biomass data. And so we've, we've been spending a lot of time building that um, and trying to get to about, you know, eight percent biomass that that's kind of the ideal nice. way to be i mean i would love to be 12 but eight percent seems to be an, a realistic number that you can hit and yeah. uh and actually um add that organic matter in there and uh but people don't realize is that the wood chips uh is huge everybody wants nitrogen 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 but the problem is is you actually need about a 30 to 1 ratio of nitrogen to carbon uh or carbon to nitrogen i'm sorry so 30 carbon to one nitrogen um, and your wood chips are coming in. I want to say those come in at like 150 to one naturally. Uh, if it's sawdust, it's about 500 to one. Um, and so you really, you, you have to have the nitrogen, but really the big ticket, the thing that gives you that volume is the carbon and you have to have volume to get a good compost as well. Mm, yeah. I just got, um, I'm just learning this, you know, as for the people watching it, I mean, I've been doing this for maybe my career has been in land clearing, landscaping, uh, forestry mulching, that stuff. But as far as like an actual, like I'm trying to grow like half of my calories thing, I've been at it for like two years yeah. and I probably, you know, looking at this, I probably have another three to go, maybe five, you know, I got it. Like we, we got hit with a frost uh, two weeks ago and now I'm like looking at everything going like, Hmm, that set me back a little bit, like a lot of bit. Yeah, that, that's exactly yeah. What, what we've been talking about here lately is because, you know, we produce 100% of our own meat, but as yeah. far as fruits and vegetables, that's where we're, where we're trying to go, and Mandolin's been working on the vegetable garden, that sort of thing. I've been working on the food for us, but people, what you don't realize is that, you know, for the vegetable garden, it's not just a matter of throwing seeds down and, and letting things spring up, and, oh, good, I've got yeah. some Now, it doesn't work that easy. You've got to practice it. So the, for those of you that are stocking up seeds thinking, I'll throw it when things, when, you know, when the flag gets raised, then you better practice now, and you better yeah. know how to get that food out. Um, but from, with a tree standpoint, you know, trees take a long time to produce. Yeah. And, and, I mean, even if you look back, I mean, you look back Old Testament biblically, you know, and, and you don't, you don't prune them for three, or you don't uh, pick a fruit off of them for three years. It's done that way for a reason. So you're building energy into the branches. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we do the same thing here. We've got several trees that are, that are three years old, that this will be the first crop we're going to take off of them this year, because we spent every year before that training the branches and pruning them and getting the energy into the root system. Yeah. Um, and so all the trees that I planted, actually I did a video this morning and I planted trees this morning and I planted about 15 or 20 trees this morning and uh, all of them will not produce anything for me for about three years. Yeah. But it doesn't feel good though. Cause you get it in there and then you're like, yeah. you know what? I'll catch you guys in three years. I mean, you got to love them. You got to take care of them between now and then, but you know, like, Hey, those suckers are in. Um, and we're going to be putting in some pecans here later this summer and the pecan trees, you know, those are, those are a 10 year time frame before you're seeing it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just learning about grafting. I didn't, I didn't really understand this. I'm kind of disappointed that we didn't do this as kids, but apparently you can grow something and, and literally graft into it. But think, think like welding in like an, a new piece of, of, of livestock, not livestock, but of live material, like a branch. And you kind of weld it in well, into it, an it, existing. It, 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 if you look at most of the fruit trees that you buy are going to be grafted, especially stone yeah. trees. So if you go buy like a peach tree, what they'll do is a lot of times they'll take a peach tree rootstock that has a very hardy rootstock, something that grows real well, but that maybe doesn't, or, or it can be a different species of tree, uh, but maybe uh, it does real well in the soil, um, but it doesn't produce a lot of fruit. And then they take another branch from another tree that produces a lot of fruit, yep. graft it on top. And, then and it'll it, cut your years down. Yep. Yeah. And cut your time down. What's yeah. really cool is the fruit cocktail trees. We have one of those. Yeah. And those are neat because that's where you've got, you know, you can be and you uh, pick your poison, but, you know, you can do a peach, a plum, an uh, apricot, whatever, and put all three of them in there and graft them all together. And then now you get all three fruits coming from one tree. It's really neat. Yeah, I've got a couple like that. So, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of permaculture because I love, like, to plant it and you're good. You know, and so what I've been doing is putting, um, I've just been learning about intercropping and by mistake this year, I had a success, which was I planted a guava, my aunt, and it just took off. I mean, it was just this big and then it's given me probably already 30 guavas so far. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, I mean, in one year, I mean, it just took off. Um, and I noticed this summer I had some nematodes or and not nematodes. I had some, I had some little things eaten. I think they're caterpillars or something like that. They're eating, they're eating some of my other 
things in there. Like I had some passion vine and stuff and some of the leaves are just getting nicked. Well, out of nowhere, I noticed I had ladybugs just gravitate to this guava. Yeah. And they just went to town on these little critters. So I was like, okay. Nematodes so now, and the, and the uh, cicadas. Yeah. And so what happened is I went out and I got another five guavas and I strategically planted them around the property. So now I'm kind of like set on my air force bases, yeah. you know, like for my, and now I'm just like, okay, cause I'm trying to biologically control everything. A great documentary I saw called The Biggest Little Farm. I recommend it for anyone. It's a really good documentary. But they talked about it's going to take seven years, and at seven years, it's going to be like riding a wave. Like once you get this thing smooth and like really, really going, and essentially this this couple documented, they that was his career. He was a filmmaker, and uh, he documented buying a dead farm. And by dead farm, I mean it was 220 acres of dead. It was really bad. It had really gone through it. I mean, it was just, it was monocultured, cropped and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and, and anyway, once they got this thing alive and they started adding animals and like, we're right at that spot where we last year or two, we added chickens. And so I'm able to use that compost their, their droppings and, uh, and even, and they make a mess, but occasionally when I'm like remulching the garden, I'll let them out in the garden for a little bit when I want them to eat through stuff. Getting some Florida crackers, man. Getting them what? Some of the Florida crackers from the cows we run. Uh, you mix them in with the cows well so uh so cow manure is almost at a perfect ratio when you think about uh what a cow does a, a cow a cow is basically a giant compost bin right yeah they yeah com- but they compost in 24 hours what mother nature would take six months to do and they produce a great byproduct off of it something that we love is beef and um so cows are really really good and the thing we like about the florida crackers is they're great for small land so you're you're on six acres right i'm on six yep yeah, so six acres. So if you're running Florida crackers, if it was all grassland, you did rotational grazing on six acres, you'd be able to run you uh, somewhere between ten and fifteen of those. Well, wow. decent with good. Yeah. You'd, you'd have to do yeah. the intensive rotational grazing, uh, yeah. which is Joe Salatin's thing. It's uh, called mob stocking herbivorous solar conversion. Love that guy. Like carbon sequestration, fertilization. Right, yeah. a bit of a mouthful. You got to practice. Yeah. That. <laughs> I love that guy though. He's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is. But but if you did something like that. That's what builds your soil. That gives you all that bacteria in your soil. That gives you um, that good nitrogen going back into your soil and the manure. And uh, and then it keeps your grasses trimmed uh, in that ideal uh, growing um, ratio. And so that's what we're doing. So our, our none of our orchards, all of our orchards will be far enough apart to where grass will grow between the trees uh, because we'll graze cows between them periodically. Now, I can't graze yep. cows in the orchard for three years because uh, i got to get the trees. Because they're little. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. uh, but what I'm going to – actually, what I'm probably going to do is in about two years is I'll fence the whole thing uh, with real tiny uh, uh, wire, woven wire fence, and we'll we'll start our piglets in there. Um, and that would be the easiest place to start our piglets, and I manure it with the piglets. Yeah, that's so cool. See, that's what I'm learning is, like, everything really does balance out. You need everything. You yeah, know, this like, is why monoculture farms don't work. Yep, yep. And then, you know, I mean, I get it. Like, the fertilizer shortages could cause food shortages or in pr- in- increase prices on food and stuff. But I think one of the biggest opportunities going right now is regenerative farming. I actually had a buddy hit me up last week and he goes, Hey, Trav, how can I get some money uh, working in regenerative farming? And I'm like, Dude, I, I need to learn a little bit more. But I think you're on to something because I definitely like envision for myself. Like I, I said this to one of my guys today. I was like, man, I'm tired of working for customers. I really am. I want to do the ranch thing kind of like, you know, where I'm like, I'm doing my 10 acres. I'm doing my 20 acres. And of course, I'll, I'll have a product to sell at some farmer's markets and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But I, where I'm at at this point is I'm like, you know, I want to acquire enough property. And I did learn from Joe, uh, Joel there that uh, he leases a lot of land. You know, he, 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 he sets up mobile farming units. Now, not permaculture, obviously. He's more into animals and livestock, chickens and things like that. Well, and but, Greg um, Judy talks about that a lot because Greg Judy's real big on leasing land because, hey, what he'll tell you is that the lease land is 100% tax deductible. Think of it like yep. a cash flow in your business. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. You can't look at it like your personal budget. You have to look at it like a business budget. The most important thing is that cash flow, numbers coming in and numbers going out. And whereas when your personal budget, we look at, okay, we want our cash flow coming in, but then we want to save it and we got to spend some, we got to enjoy some. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different equation. And so uh, when it comes to us person, we want to own as much land as we can. But when it comes to our business, I'm all yep. about cash flow, cash flow, yeah, cash, yeah. cash flow. So, um, you know, we'll, we're, we're going to be leasing land. We, we have 20 acres, but, but this is the thing. And this is one thing that we want to talk about today is you can do a lot with small acreage. Right. And those, you, you, if you have one acre, and this is what I've, what I've shown people is the, um, the orchard that we're putting in is going to be about one acre. 
And on that one acre, it will produce enough food for me to take care of my family as far as our fruit and nut requirements. Uh, but also, it will give us enough to sell. And what's really cool is we're putting a high tunnel on it. That high tunnel, I'll be able to run things that I wouldn't be able to run normally here. I'll be able to grow things like avocados and and uh, uh, and mangoes and dragon fruits and stuff like that that I wouldn't normally be able to do here. And now I can be a local producer of these. And I guarantee you, I will sell out every year. So I'm assuming high tunnel means like greenhouse. Yeah, it's a it's a greenhouse that's really tall. Um, and yeah. they're pretty pricey. They're about $10,000, but the USDA okay. did a lot of grants on them. And we got a grant that covered most of it. I have to do the site prep work. I have to yeah. get water to it. And I have to come out of pocket about $1,000 on it, but they're going to pay. Oh, it's not bad. Wow. No, nice. Okay, cool. And, um, and, and, and you know, it, the, 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 the funding is all out there for a lot. USDA has a lot of funding out there for small hobby farms. Yeah. Uh, they, they love this stuff. So, uh, and you can call them, they can help you get water to your farms. Uh, they can help you with cross fencing and stuff like that. Uh, they have limitations on it. And, and anytime you enter into a government program, you give them the ability to audit it for so many years, which is one of the downsides to it. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. which is why we did ours on the other side of the road. So that would, that was part of it so that we can control like, Hey, they only have access to this side of the road. So gotcha. there's anything wrong here, but I like my privacy. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, that totally makes sense. I mean, that gives me a good idea because I've got the dragon fruit, the mangoes, I've got all those items that you listed off. And so it really kind of makes me think because you're up there in Alabama, it kind of expands my market because one of my, one of my things is besides making the food and having that as a byproduct to one feed our family, but then feed my extended family and then additional to that fa- friends and then customers. Well, um, there, there's a, there's a citrus farm in Montana. And, Holy uh, smokes. And, and, and he's raising citrus in Montana yeah, uh, in the awesome. middle of winter, and he's having to go up there and clean off. And the, and the way to do this is for, for y'all that are up north is, you know, these things are, the, the potential is out there, and you don't have to spend $10,000 on a high tunnel. If we hadn't gotten the grant, we would have done something else. Um, but there's, there's very simple ways to do this. And one of the easiest ways to do this is to go rent an excavator. You can rent an excavator for about $400 a day. And basically what you dig is you dig a big pit. And then over the top of it, you put your you, you put your greenhouse over the top of it and build it. And then the trees are down at the bottom and they're growing out. And then you could run citrus trees in there and you run dwarf varieties that are smaller. But you can get a 10 or 12 foot loft. Yeah. It doesn't cost that much. I mean, for $1,000, you could put that together. That's incredible. See, there's there's a lot of things to do. So if I'm if I'm just starting out, I mean, one, I'm just trying to start. You know, just get yourself some soil. And, you know, if you if you got to buy it for your first year, like you get it from a landscape supply store, get some compost, add some chips to it because it'll just build on you. That's what I'm finding. I've actually got worms in a compost bin, and today my daughter and I were taking them and like we were putting them around our banana trees and stuff, and they were just handfuls of worms. Yeah. And I was like, man, this is cool because we started with like twenty. You yeah. know, 30, I bought, I went and bought them, got them in a little can, you know, mixed right. them, some red wigglers, whatever it was. And, and now I was like, I don't know if it's going to work, you know, and now I've got hundreds in there and I can just pull from it almost every day. I can just pull from it and just put it. And now it's like, you know, I'm in year two of the food forest, but I'm actually starting to see a little bit of results happening now. Mm-hmm. Cause I'm like, okay, now things are really starting to, and that's before adding to the chicken manure. Because we've been, we're so young with the chicken manure where it's still aging on me. Because my understanding is you can't just take chicken manure and dump it on plants. It'll burn them. Yeah, so chicken has a really high nitrogen count, and so because of that, you have to let it decompose a little bit because not, you can you can burn the soil with nitrogen, and uh, it really causes some problems. Now, for the orchard, I'll be honest with you, we throw our chicken manure directly on the orchard. I don't throw it directly on the garden. I compost mm-hmm. it before it goes in the garden, but we throw it around the orchard trees and around the base of the plants, and we've never had a problem with it. Okay. So take that <clears> for what it's worth. But I we, tried some the other day, and it seems to be fine. Yeah, I, we use we use the chicken uh, scrap, everything that's left over from them. We use that basically as a mulch around all of our orchard trees. And I figured that some of the nitrogen gets washed into the soil, some of it doesn't. But And then our compost, the, the large compost bin pit that we're creating, this is where we're going to be able to take, you know, dump truck loads of wood chips, um, oh. and, and we'll have to turn it with a tractor. But that And that compost bin that we're making right now, that's actually over by the orchard, so anything that leaches out into the soil gets absorbed into the orchard as well. So um, it kind of gives us a double purpose there. And yeah. then the last thing for that orchard or for that compost bin is we'll actually, the sides on that, are going to be hardy enough that they'll be able to take pigs. Um, and then that way I can use pit, put pigs in there and raise pigs out inside the compost bin and they'll turn the compost for me. That's a Joel thing. I learned that yeah, from Joel yeah, last week. You get the pigs and they turn it. Yeah. And that's super cool. So, I mean, yeah, get going, get started. I like the fact that, you know, I actually 
considered green we call them greenhouses down here shade houses actually more or less because sometimes things can be too hot yeah so we need we need to like chill it out a little bit like for example i haven't been able to pull pull i haven't been able to pull off peaches down here they they, just, they die on me my mother-in-law's got a great peach tree at her house but she's about an hour north of us mm-hmm. but but nonetheless a shade house for being able to start things i also realized like we just got our, our first real frost that we've hadn't had a frost in a few years and it it wrecked havoc through yeah. our through our situation so I, it made me realize like there are solutions there you got frost cloth you got grove heaters they're basically like uh big five gallon buckets of diesel with a torch on them essentially yeah, it's we, like we can talk about that with the smudge pots that you know smudge you, pots. Can, you, can, you can use motor yeah. oil you can use smudge pots yeah uh, my neighbor's yeah. fixing to build one because he wants it for uh for doing bonfires at his place yeah right. yeah so what do you do with the smudge pot it's like oh, i want to roast weedies on it man. <laughs> yeah yeah so i realized you know i've got some infrastructure to do the, the, the last thing well another thing there for for smaller areas i wasn't a believer in hydroponics and i was actually messing with a few people on it i know like you know like i, I think the ninja had mentioned that uh, he wanted to do some hydroponics and i was well, in the comments and I talked about it and you commented on the video that was actually the first time i ever yeah i actually that. did a week after that i go to a place called the land of the light it's called land of the light he got a usda loan five acre little thing guys like a full-time pastor he like travels the world he teaches people a farm all over the world and stuff super cool dude and he shows me his aquaponics setup and i went back to that video and i was basically like i'm wrong <laughs> like, like i felt so bad about it because i was like oh it doesn't work because i've seen friend after friend fail at this oh i'm gonna get a, a external pool i'm gonna get a kitty pool i'm gonna and like they have like they lose power for one day or their solar panels or you know it's you got to be a systems guy yeah. to really be in aquaponics okay you got to be a nerd about it and some people just they're about it you know but you for do my, it's an actively managed thing that's the yeah. bigger thing with it you got to actively manage it yeah no and so anyway i i i had a video I actually did a video like right after that where i i show uh it's landed a light i believe is one of the titles in there and i was like i was wrong because he had figured it out and the fish manure the fish waste was amazingly good for his plants and then he said go to home depot or lowe's and look at what they charge for fish emulsion and it will have the the nitrogen and the phosphorus numbers anyway it was 24 bucks for a bottle of fish poop and i'm like that alone makes me want to get out of coponic system just for the fertilizer we're going to be setting up an aquaponics here on the farm but ours is a little bit different because i, I do have land here and so i'm not limited by uh, by my space right i'm not stuck yeah. on a quarter acre plot to subdivision and so because we have some property and we have some some hillsides and some hollers we're actually going to be damming up one of the hollers and we'll be using that and, and that'll end up getting getting stocked with fish and then we'll yeah. pull directly out of that right out uh, of it and, and yeah and so i won't have an actual holding tank for the fish we'll have just a big pond that is yeah. part of our loop and then i'll have that that'll go in to basically a uh, a sump where you can raise like crawfish and stuff like that, um, mm-hmm. and then that'll be filtered into the orchard and into the greenhouse to actually yep. water all the all the orchard. There, there's so much. I think the thing that I'm enjoying the most about it is my buddy described this as Minecraft. Now I never played Minecraft, but apparently it's like an internet game. It's kind of like The Sims. When I was a kid, I was into The yeah, Sims. My, my kids love it, and we, we don't <laughs> let our kids don't hardly ever do video games, but they love <laughs> Minecraft. But but he's like, dude, you're just out here doing real live Minecraft, and I go, oh, yeah, I'm doing Minecraft. Minecraft, man, because like every year I'm just building a little bit more, a little bit more. I'm adding some infrastructure. I'm adding some water spigots here. Like, you know, so I mean, for, for me, and from the, the mental model I learned when I really got into this and I got into this a while ago, but I didn't, wasn't doing it every day. Mm-hmm. I, I got into this in college. They taught us the idea of a food forest and I helped our student government get one built at my mm-hmm. college. And, um, but like once I started doing it every day, I was like, okay, this is like, it's a process. It's like working out. Mm-hmm. it's not like you just go work out three times and you're like, yo, I'm good now. I'm jacked. Yeah. It's like, and it's not like you work out for four or five months and then you're like, okay, I'm good now. I'm jacked. It's like you get into a habit. Right. And then once you get into a habit and you got your diet and you, you're, and you're into it, you're into it. There are times where you go, okay, I'm going to really go hard right now and like really expand. And then you get the benefits of that expansion. And then, and then, I mean, once it's going, it's going is yeah. what I've found. And that's been the, that's been the the one thing I don't think I thought through because I think two years ago I planted this thing and I thought, okay, I'm planted, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't, I didn't really know, okay, now I got a bug problem. 
okay. And so you, you now you sit, you go into the next phase and you're like, how can I biologically control this? So it's not a problem. And then well, it's the same way with anything that you're growing on your farm is that because, you know, we have, we, we have, we have a beef cattle here and we check out, we look at our cattle herd every single day, every single day we walk through the cows. One of us does, whether it's the kids or me or my wife or whatever, mm-hmm. one of walks from, you have to treat your orchard as the same thing. It's a growing uh, yep. organism on your farm and it is, it is a crop. It is a, it is, you know, your livestock effectively. And you have to treat it the same way, whether that's you have one peach tree or you have, you know, 300. You have to yep. treat it that way. Yep. And, yep. Uh, and, and, but it's been going and, you know, it's getting exciting and it's starting to get to that spot. Where, like we're just with the eggs. I just reached it like last month where I'm like, I got too many eggs. Mm-hmm. So my brother came over and I'm like, yo, let me load you up. Let me load you up because I got too many. I don't have enough to sell and I don't have enough. I can't. I got too many to eat. So I'm finally getting to that one, that like spot where it's like, okay, it's starting to run like a flywheel. And I would recommend everybody um, that that biggest little farm. That's where I learned that terminology. Mm-hmm. The the mentor, the guru, if you will, the guy uh, in the documentary. He was like, once you get this going, it's gonna be like a flywheel. It's gonna be like riding a wave. It's just every season that comes around, it's just gonna get better and better and better. And and they kept on introducing and kept on having setbacks, and they just kept on introducing and intercropping, and and then they just got it dialed in, and the cash flows the place was spinning off was quite astounding yeah and and you know and that kind of brings me to a kind of the idea of of planting those trees is because you hear so many people they're like hey i bought 10 orchard trees and one of them lived and it's like well again this is not an overnight process and you're going to go through some failures you're going to have some plants die we we relocated several uh, plants from our old orchard because we're moving our orchard i couldn't re- relocate everything because some of them were mm-hmm. too big uh, but we relocated a bunch and i'm not sure if they're going to make it you know you you, you just kind of risk it and so pl- uh, part of that it comes into the planting is that you you're going to plant 10 trees and they're not all going to survive. You're going to have to plan on some loss and you're going to have to plan on, okay, next year we got to try something else. Uh, you're going to get some type of beetle infestation that's going to kill them off. That's why we do a polyculture of our orchard trees. So I have various orchard trees. I don't have like a row of peaches and a row of plums. We have them all separated out uh, throughout our orchard is because I want to, and if, if I could, I would do it all over the farm, but that's not conducive for picking. Yep. Um, so, you know, we, we separate them out as much as possible. And yep. uh, so I think that, that kind of comes into, you'll learn how to plant trees and planting trees is not an exact science. And you'll hear, you talk to 20 different orchardists and you'll get 20 different ways of planting the tree properly. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, and, and once you do get the trees, like one thing I've been doing is I'm big in avocados. That's one of my big speculations. Right? People are like, what? you know, my speculation, are like silver crypto and like avocados <laughs> and, and uh and I, I so anyway i've got really fascinated with avocados this last two years and i've been collecting all different types of avocados and i'm learning that when you make a guacamole you save that seed i just found a system to germinate a seed you know how some people do the water cup and you know yeah, I, people, it. I never could get it to work it doesn't work but you know i got a system now where i got a flower box with some good dirt in it and we stick it halfway in there like an egg and i just take a watering can once or twice a week keep it wet Oh, and that and, works. And it's just the area that it seems to be sitting at in the barn. It seems to like it. It's not too hot, not too bright. It just likes it. And so, oh. and so, yeah, I put maybe one out of, I think two out of every three are, are basically sprouting on me now. Oh, and wow. so I'm potting them up. I did learn that if you keep them in a one, one gallon pot too long, it'll immediately die. They'll be like, great. And if you don't pot them up in time, boom, dead. Um, but I did, I think successfully graft my first one from a big tree into a small one because the the uh, science with the avocado is like only one in ten thousand is going to be something you want to eat and it's going to take seven to ten years to have a fruit so in avocados it, it it definitely benefits you to graft them and so i've been out collecting these random avocados you know haas avocado and all these all these brands of mm-hmm. avocado and i've just been trying to figure out okay I, now i can grow the seed i know i'm growing the tree good now and so now i'm just learning how to graft them but once you do that you got yourself like a sixty-five or ninety-dollar plant, right? Yeah, and we, you can we're, make. We're doing actually something similar with our peach trees, um, and and because the peaches here are huge, and again, same for thing. I can I can uh, take that cutting, um, and once I once I propagate it, I can have a seventy-dollar plant in one year. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I look around at these the, these small, um, you know, little uh, nurseries around, and I'm like, the the amount of money that they waste on things like like the the pots that the, those little those little uh, you know foam or not foam plastic pots that they send them in. Yep. I'm like, man, you could go down to the barbecue joint and get all their leftover five gallon food grade buckets that they have to pay to dispose of. You could do uh. those all day long and plant in five gallon buckets. 
I didn't think about that because that's been one of my biggest costs, actually. Well, that's I mean, what we plant it. We, I, I, we, we have a bunch of food grade buckets, and we go down to the barbecue place. They'll give me all I want, and I drill, I drill four holes in the bottom of wow. each one of them, and yep. then it, it's perfect pot. That, that's something for you guys, too, just getting going with this. I discovered you can walk into a Starbucks, especially if you give them a warning, and they will give you a bag of coffee grinds, and that is like fire for your plants. I mean, that is like good. You put it in your compost, and there's a whole science to it. You know, YouTube around, figure it out. I'm also finding with my local uh, grocer. It's like a nice small. They got like six locations. Mm -hmm. I can walk in there and get the tops of their pineapples for free. They got a bucket full of them every yeah, I saw afternoon. your video on that. Yeah, and then um, I, this is a little crazy, but I'm getting some containers for the back of my truck. And I'm going to try to get some of their dead fish carcass stuff because yeah. they got a meat section. So I'm going to try to get that and just kind of like the pilgrim story with the Native Americans where the Native Americans taught the pilgrims how to put it underneath their corn crop and everything. I've been doing that with a few with a few fish and things like that that I've, uh, you know, some chickens and stuff like that that I've harvested. And so far, so good. Yeah, and, that, and that's so, right. actually so. Our uh, our our cemetery for our livestock is actually in our orchard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it, 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 it's it's yeah. our our all of our animals end up going back to it. And it's like, yeah. uh, and and you know the dog's happy out there. So when the dog finally dies, he'll be the you know she'll go to the orchard too. Like yeah. everybody goes to the orchard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's cool because it's like you can build the stuff for free. You know, like you can literally get your, your soil built for free. I mean, a lot of it comes with like, if you're going to have a banana in the morning, save the peel and put it in a compost bin. Yeah. Um, I just got a rolling compost bin actually from a customer of mine yesterday. Um, yeah, I had a regular actually, compost. We're actually fixing to build one out of some old 55 gallon yeah. barrels. Because it's we, the way to go. We used to store all of our pig feed in 55 gallon barrels. And we have since we've actually ordered a, uh, a large three ton mobile uh, uh, grain store uh, that we can pull behind the tractor. Yep. Uh, it's got like a little electronic grain auger on it. Um, and we just ordered that. So that'll be here for our pigs for this year for us to raise out our, all our, all our crops. But um, the, uh, so I have all these 55 gallon barrels left over that, uh, you know, that are all good plastic with the clamp on lids and everything. And so it's been like, what do I do with these? And that's one of the things that we're going to do is they're going to have a, a rolling compost bin with one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, all these things are very resourceful. I mean, what I've learned is once I started buying plants, I started Craigslisting around for plants. I've run into the coolest old ladies that have like setups, you know, like I went to a lady's house the other day. I made a YouTube video out of it. Whole place, babes, maybe a quarter acre, completely planted. She told me 80% of her food comes from her yard. Yeah. I saw and that. I know I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, and I dropped four hundred with her, and I and I and she had two customers before me because she had sold a, a and she had she had a multiple grafted mango that I really wanted, had the two varieties I wanted, and I showed up and I said, oh, I also want that. She goes, oh, I just sold it, just sold it an hour ago. So I did the math when I was heading out of there, and I'm like, this lady's probably doing like a thousand bucks on a Saturday, cash. Well, and you know that that's the thing too is there is so much stuff that you can plant in your area that people just uh, be, because there's no farmers around there doing it like there's no farmers yeah. around here growing kiwis but i can plant golden kiwis your golden kiwis will grow naturally here and, and they'll grow further mm -hmm. up in northern alabama they'll grow up as far up in, in tennessee i believe and so we're getting ready we're going to have a, a golden uh, golden kiwi um uh, a vine here because they grow like grapes too on like a vineyard and uh, and so we're going to have the golden kiwis here and then i'm going to start propagating them and selling them because yeah. Yeah. especially once we get the greenhouse up and uh, yeah. actually do some propagation inside there uh, yeah. and can have a row of things that, you know, in those five gallon <clears> buckets <throat> that we're getting ready. And then if I'm doing them and I'm propagating them in five gallon buckets, I can one charge a premium for it because I can grow things bigger. So I can get that tree, you know, and, and get these six foot trees that, I, that, that, you know, and take a, take a year or two to grow them before we actually sell them. Um, and so you have a lot of options there. So don't be, don't limit yourself to what the local farmers are doing. There is so much more that grows naturally there that you can do. I mean, when I was up in Alaska, I mean, you can grow blueberries, you can grow cranberries. Nice. I mean, there, there is, there you right. can grow raspberries. There is, it's, it's limitless. Wow. Yeah, I do. I, the more I learn about what can grow here, the more I'm like, I keep expanding my number. Yeah. Like of, of, of stuff. Originally I thought, ah, 20, 30, 40 things. It's like over 300. I yeah. can't even pronounce most of these things. And, you know, and so I'm just like, man, it, the world is so much more abundant than we think it, it is, especially when you start to work with it. And then I think the, the case is like so bullish for like, I'm starting to see farmers markets pop up everywhere. Kids are involved. Like it actually makes me feel really good about what we're walking into right now. Cause it seems like crazy when you watch the news, you watch, you know, any, anything going on. But then at the same time, it's like, you know what though? Like people, we're, we're going to have a hard time importing avocados, mm -hmm. I think. 
over the next five or 10 years, but it's going to incentivize people like, you know, if I, if I grow a three gallon avocado, I know it's 95 bucks. I buy them all the time, mm-hmm. buy them all the time, you know? And it's like, it's like, it's only a year out to make one of those things, Yeah, you know, cause once you got the tree, you can make 20, 30, 50 of them. If you've got the seeds, you know, good. And they're, you know, seeds got to be a year old, but I'm doing the math on it. And I'm like, each avocado not only is going to give me like a hundred, say, you know, a hundred fruits at two bucks a fruit or something like that. So each avocado is not only going to give me 200 bucks, but just in the propagation of it, I would probably make a thousand bucks on each tree right. in, in three or four years. Right. Right. You know, Absolutely. when they're good to go. So there is a lag to it, but I'm like doing the math in my head and I'm like, this is actually like anyone can do this. Well, you can do it on small land because all yeah. it's all container farming. I mean, you could do yep. this on a half an acre in a subdivision. And, yeah. and I don't know about you, but I don't know. I, I'm not aware of any HOAs that limit how many fruit trees you can grow. <laughs> Dude, our, our local town here allows four chickens no matter what property you're in. Yeah. And yeah. You're not allowed to have- it changes if you if you name them chickens and rabbits. Oftentimes we'll get by on the on the HOAs and the, and the zoning codes and stuff if you name them. Um, <laughs> so they're a, they're a pet yeah. and not, a, not, not livestock. Yeah, you can can't have roosters, but, but like, you know, we're on a six acres. We can have whatever we want, but, but in my, in my childhood neighborhood, they, I remember I was in high school and I remember reading the newspaper and it was like, huh, this is cool. Like, this is a step in the right direction, Yeah, you know? Cause it's like four chickens is all you need, you know? And I mean, that, that'll give you plenty of eggs. You know? Yeah. You know, that's one thing. So I, I, I'll actually push back on you on that idea. Cause that, that's funny that you brought well, that you up. Well, you eat my eggs all the time. My, my yeah. wife and I talk about this all the time and we're like, actually, because, because chickens go through high and low seasons of when they naturally produce eggs. Yeah. And so, you know, if you think, okay, if I've got 10 chickens, there's 10 chickens, I'm going to get on average about six eggs a day. Um, and that should take me, except for you're going to go through molting seasons where you're not going to have any eggs. So you've got to, you, you didn't need to water bath eggs. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where you nope. still, um, basically you, you store them in, in, um, in, in uh, concrete line and, uh, it, it's, uh, I can go over it with you offline, okay. on that, but it's, it's pretty okay. easy process. We store them in five gallon buckets, okay. um, but, uh, it's slate line. Um, but, uh, but anyways, um, so you can water bath them and you can store them or like what we do, we just buy 20 chickens every year. I buy 20 chicks every year because we free range them. And so we're going to lose a bunch of them. Uh, yep. they're get eaten and, and we don't sell the eggs. So it doesn't have to be super efficient and, yep. they, and they fertilize it as they free range and go out. And yep. actually when we get the greenhouse built, what I'm actually doing is I'm building a double sided coop that'll sit on the side of the greenhouse that one door will open up into there and then one will open up into an outside run. And then um, that way when the season's done, I can let them into the greenhouse and they'll fertilize everything and they'll stay in there for the winter. And then I can let them free range on the other side in the, in the summertime. But, uh, but, nice. but chicken eggs, what we found is that it's not a bad thing to have extra chicken eggs because they're no. good. one, they're good for your garden. Your dogs will love them. And for yep. us, we feed them with pigs and any small farm, as long as you don't have an HOA prohibiting you from doing it, Anybody that's on a half an acre can raise two pigs. Pigs take an unbelievably small amount of land to raise in a healthy fashion. Now, you have to do a deep bedding, so you have to understand how a deep bedding works. Um, otherwise, you're going to have a smelly, nasty mess, and you're going to be raising them unethically in their own crap. So you mm-hmm. want to do a deep bedding. But, but pigs, can, they can be raised in a very, very small pen. Um, it's very inexpensive to, to, to get them set up. So I encourage everybody, if you like mm-hmm. pork, raise your own pigs. They are super, super easy. You always want to raise them in pairs. Wow. Okay. That's cool. That's, uh, that adds to my list because I've been thinking through like what I'm going to add this next year or two. I think I'm going to do the aquaponics thing is kind of like one of my next moves, but I've been thinking like, I, you're warming me up to pigs. My neighbor okay, did so, pigs. I'm so, like, so, I could probably do it. Let me just give you a brief 30 second rundown on the easiest way to do these pigs, right? If you're going to raise pigs just for you that you're not selling. Okay. Yeah. So a family of four, everybody underestimates how much meat they go through. And just to let you know, like, honestly, we go through at least one cow and two pigs a year. That's what well, we're a family of five. And we eat a lot okay. of meat, but yeah. that's what we reasonably go through. Half my customers think that a quarter cow will last them the whole year and they're, they're out in two months. It's like, no, you need, you, you eat a lot more yeah. meat than you think you do. Okay. And um, so, so a family of four, family of four, family of six, somewhere in that range, two pigs would get you through the whole year for all your, all your pork needs. Um, and, uh, and you, and you have some, some extra, you'd have plenty, plenty, you know, to give some away to some friends and family and stuff like that. But two pigs, you always raise pigs in pairs because they compete for the food and they won't get big if they don't. And they're social animals. And the way to do it is you take, you get, you get, uh, um, six cattle panels, right? Cattle panels from tractor supplier, $28 a piece for a 16 foot cattle panel. 
and you put them and you make a little rectangle out of those cattle panels and you don't even need a gate on one end, just staple it shut and climb over. <laughs> it's, it's super easy. But basically what you do is you get aspirin there to give you wood chips or you do hay. You can buy cheap junk hay from farmers for about thirteen fifty a bale for a big bale, a big round roll and they'll deliver it and they mm-hmm. can pull it right off there. You don't need a tractor or anything, um, but you basically deep bed it and you just put, you put about a foot of bedding in there and the pigs will compact it down and they'll manure in it and you just keep adding that bedding and you raise that up because a pig will not climb over things they, they just they do they, they refuse to climb so you can get that bedding up there three feet in that and if those if those cattle panels are four feet with a wire and electric wire across the top they'll never go down there wow that's cool that's real cool all right sweet i'm gonna be re-watching this and taking notes on this yeah it's, it's a that's, really neat way yeah. of doing it so i encourage everybody to do pigs that if you don't have an yeah. hoa that prohibits it you should be doing pigs Wow. Okay, cool. So there's, we, we covered a ton of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that I think just get going, get going with soil building and then whatever works in your area. Cause the more I run into people, the more I'm just amazed at what I see. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we've got a place South of us and it's called echo and it's like, it is mind boggling what they do down there Yeah. as far as like what they propagate. And, and, and the more I see these like farms that are established and, and I'm, I'm starting to see more food forest m- polyculture farms coming together. Um, but I'm looking at a few of them that have been going for a while, like before it started getting trending. And, uh, and I'm like, these guys are killing it. Like the, the land of delight farm, five acres. And I'm doing the math on what I'm spending there and what everybody else is spending there. And like the plants that are coming in and out of there and how big some of his stuff has gotten over the last four or five years. He's got cuttings off everything. And I'm like, man, this he's cleaning up. Yeah. Like, no, he's, I'm, I'm super stoked to learn how to propagate all of our plants here and everything yeah. and like learn how to split them and, and do all that. Like I, yeah. I am stoked to get this, uh, this food for us going over the next three or four years. Yeah, dude. And it does take a while, you know, it does take a while, but it becomes a community thing. My dad came out and helped me run some fence not too long ago. And I was like, this is cool, you know, cause we, we never did any of that together, you know, like we did some projects and stuff, but I was like, Hey, I'm going to need help, you know, cause I bought eight foot rolls. Mm-hmm. I had to have this stuff specially ordered. I put two feet in the ground, six feet for the deer. And then I put a wire across and, uh, and I was like, it was heavy, man. I need my tractor to move it. And then I was like, I don't know how I'm going to, you know, and my dad got out there, my brother came out and it was like, we started running fence for deer yeah, fence. You, you need one of the unrollers that go on the three point. Yeah. To I, I got a dolly and I started you're doing a lot of it. That doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. You know? And I mean, but this year, you know, I got some more money. The way I do my money too, is like, I'll sell some crap I don't need. And then I've got some bamboo in the property. I started a few years ago. So I'm at the spot where I'm selling it and I'm actually, not saying I'm getting out of bamboo, but I'm selling off most of my bamboo so I can make room for my edibles. Now that the edibles are starting to grow uh-huh. and I'll just keep that in that bucket. So if I sell a plant, I'll just buy more plants, yeah. you know, and, uh, and it's been good. Or I sell off some junk, some stuff. I had too much stuff in the barn and stuff and I've been selling off junk. And then I've been like, sweet, here's some fencing, here's some poles, here's some, you know, and it doesn't take like, it, it's not like I put a ton into it every month, but I put a few hundred bucks every month, a good month, you know, maybe, maybe seasonally I'll, I'll make like a big investment, like 1500 bucks or, you know, for our, for what we're doing, you know, what I'm learning is actually it. I thought it was going to be the materials that would hold me back the cost, but really it's like, now that you got the materials, you're going to dedicate your weekend to get that done. Yeah. And the weekend the time that we find is the bigger thing. And yeah. especially because we're, we're clearing, you know, our 20 acres is completely wooded when I bought it. I mean, it's just full yeah. of white oaks and same. And yeah. Dry. So we've been clearing and it takes a long time to clear by hand yeah. when you're talking. Yeah. And, and even with us, we've got a small tractor. It still takes a long time to clear. And then we try to make use of all the lumber. So everything, you know, we're either sawmilling the lumber or it could be about that. We bought that, that sawmill for the farm, that band sawmill. You need or, to keep me updated on that. That's my oh. next thing. I've been looking at those going like, yo, kind of want to do this. Oh man, that, that thing is worth its weight in gold. Uh, it paid for itself three times over in the year that we've owned it. We've only owned it a year and wow. uh, it, it has paid for itself. I've added the lumber prices up and, and three times over what we paid for that thing. What uh, model did you have? I got the Woodland Mills 122 uh, it's, and I got a 16 foot with a trailer. Okay. I wanted the ability to take it to the logs um, and I've been mostly happy with the trailer. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things that if I was doing it again, I'm not sure I'd pay for the trailer or not. I'm not sure it'd be necessarily worth it. Bring the logs uh, I, to this. Yeah. I don't feel like the larger sawmills are worth the price that you get for them. Cause you know, that's the smallest model that Woodland Mills makes. And, mm-hmm. 
Um, I have not come across a log yet that I've logged here that I've been able to handle and get up there that it couldn't cut. Okay, um, cool. And that's the thing. Unless you're unless you're really getting into it, wanting to make some big slabs and and stuff, and then you need all the hydraulics and the big tractor to load it yeah. and that sort of thing. So. Yeah. We, we've been real happy with that one, and cool. uh, I would definitely get the track extension because we can do 16-foot lumber on ours, which is, gives us the ability to do dimensional building grade lumber. Nice. Yeah. Dude, I, my buddy does split uh, split wood for firewood, and we're in Florida, and he's like, dude, I got a ton of customers, man. I got repeat customers. He'll put together, like, cratefuls of stuff, and I'm like, you know, I got these tree guys dropping chips, and they're always asking, hey, can we drop logs and stuff? I'm like, ah, I don't have a way to process it. Can we pay to drop logs? I'm like, ah, I don't really want to get into it, but, but I've recently been thinking, like, I don't really want to work for customers anymore. I want people to come to me, you know? know? Like, well, that's why we're getting our farm going, because I'm tired of working for customers yeah so we, have, we have an inspection business in birmingham we run a, a one of the, the uh, one of the largest uh uh property inspection businesses in birmingham and uh it, it, it's it, i don't know i'm just tired of customers they're they're same. Customers are ahead same. Of yeah dude i'm totally down for like just propagating trees all day picking picking fruit feeding chickens cleaning out coops and yeah. like sawing some lumber like i'm yeah. down for that <laughs> like it sounds great <laughs> yeah no i'm 100 percent with you man no, that's cool right but hey yeah. Trev, we went on a little bit longer than we thought we were going to so let's uh we can wrap this one up i don't know do you want to do a second part of this yeah your- definitely man definitely okay. let's do a, we'll do a part two over on so my channel will be on on-site trash channel if y'all have not checked out his channel i'll have a link down in the description and uh, other than that we will catch y'all later Thank <laughs> you.